first, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, Sesame Street, just in case some of you are unfamiliar with it, or it may have been a few years since you last watched it. Um, then some overall thoughts on the mobile market and the growth that uh, that industry has seen over the past few years. Then we're going to dig into how we at Sesame Street are producing apps. Uh, it's a pretty detailed process, uh, and we'll share some insights with you on that front. Uh, finally, we'll come back out and actually look at the app market as a whole uh, from a very global point of view, and then touch on some potential opportunities. So I think can we roll the video, please. I'm going to start with a little video. In 1969, one little street launched a revolution in children's education by using television as a tool for learning. Over 40 years later, the most trusted brand among parents continues to meet children's educational needs through new and emerging technology. Oh, I'm gonna keep my head up high, keep on reaching high, never gonna quit, I'll keep getting stronger. From our award-winning television show, Welcome to Sesame Street, to our award-winning website, Sesame Street is a safe place where parents and kids can watch videos, play games, and much more. Okay, hang on a minute. I'll help you find the really right one. Here we go. Right. Learning can even happen on the go with our mobile site customized for portability. Our top-rated podcasts offer a wide range of teachable moments from letter recognition to vocabulary to healthy habits. Good hygiene is very healthy. Sesame Street mobile apps make learning fun and interactive. Can you give me eyes and a nose? To give your monster eyes, touch it where the eyes should go. Nice one. And everyone can follow their furry friends on Twitter and Facebook. Boy, me and Cookie for every friend we have, me be set for life. The little street that began it all is not so little after all. Every day, Sesame Street continues to look for new, innovative ways to make learning fun, engaging, and accessible so that children all over the world may reach their highest potential. I'll keep it strong, girl. Uh, so as mentioned, Sesame Street's been around for 43 years. Uh, the first show aired in 1969 in the U.S. Uh, and the basic premise is the following. Uh, then and today, to be honest with you, how can we use the power of media to help children reach their full potential? Our team of 300, 350 people in New York and our local partners around the world, honestly, we wake up every morning thinking, how can we use media to uh, influence and uh, positively shape children's lives? Um, in 1969, television was the brand new, if you will, hot technology of the day, and the founder of Sesame Street, Joan Cans Cooney, thought, how can we use television to influence people, influence kids. And today, uh, we've come a long way, uh, but our overall mentality hasn't changed so much. So whereas television still plays a major role in what we do, we've obviously diversified into different areas. Um, really quickly, the Sesame model consists of the following. First of all, we start off with a broad mission in mind. And for us, it's always educational. We're an educational company at heart. We then, uh, and that mission is then combined with mass media, uh, be it television or, or, or the web or what have you. So we combine all of those, and what comes out here might be a little bit difficult to see is the, is the final product, which is educational content that addresses academic basics, numeracy, literacy, emotional well-being, health and wellness, uh, respect, understanding, all sorts of issues. So oftentimes people think of Sesame Street as just numbers and letters, but actually we're far more than that and we take a very holistic view of children's needs uh, as they're growing up, certainly in the very tender ages of one through five, the preschool market, where so much of one's personality uh, uh, is being formed. Um, and as mentioned, I touched on it earlier, we're far more than a television. In fact, today, through all of these uh, media platforms, we uh, reach about well over 20 million people a month. Uh, so television is a huge part of what we do, but we're very active in using digital media from the web to podcasts, applications. I'll dig into some of the applications a bit more. 
Um, and background-wise, uh, just in the U.S. alone, uh, we have well over what we call 82 million graduates. These are people who have actually grown up watching Sesame Street. And obviously that number is far greater globally, but in the U.S. it's, it's 82 million. One interesting statistic, which uh, uh, I'm really proud of, is that children who've grown up watching Sesame Street in the U.S., by the time they reach high school, let's say 15, 16, 17, they score about 15 to 17% better uh, on their academic uh, work and, and results. So uh, we're very proud of the fact that our methodology, our, our processes really do uh, work. Um, and we're trying to replicate that across the world on different platforms. Speaking of the world, uh, we're often too referred to as the longest street in the world. Uh, our program, thanks to many of our, our partners here, uh, is aired on 150 different, uh, well over 150 different countries. But in 25 to 27 countries, we have local productions uh, where we partner with local uh, media entities and we come up with a very specific targeted program with local Muppets, local issues, and what have you. And those have proven to be very, very successful. These are some of them, obviously. Now, a big part of the reason I'm here today uh, is, uh, is that children's media choices uh, and consumption, rather, has been changing drastically, very dramatically over the past several decades, really. As you can see, going back uh, a few years to the 30s and 50s for several decades, until really the 90s, children's media options were somewhat limited, uh, for better or for worse. Movie, print, radio, and TV were really the dominant uh, platforms. But in the 90s, there's been a really seismic, dramatic shift in, how, in, in terms of options, what's available for children, and how they consume media. Uh, as you can see on the far right side, uh, video games, music players uh, started really en entering homes across the world. In the 90s, internet was starting to become big, mobiles, what have you. And, and today, and moving forward, uh, and we've just seen much, much more of that. Uh, and there's just so much that was running out of the uh, PowerPoint, really. Today we're going to focus a little bit on, quite a bit, I'd rather say, on mobile phones and internet in particular, because uh, the impact and, uh, on children's well-being and all of our collective uh, businesses is really profound. Okay. Here we go. So as a result of that, by the way, the chart that you saw, children's media consumption has been going uh, uh, through the roof. This is targeting, this data is from slightly older kids, but it applies uh, to various age groups. Uh, over the past 10, 12 years, children have gone from consuming about seven hours of, uh, of media per day. Uh, a lot of this data is UBS focused, but again, I, I think uh, there are parallels across the world. It's gone, we've gone from over seven hours a day to well over 10 hours per day, um, which is quite amazing if you think about the fact that children uh, I don't know, speak, sleep eight, 10 hours a day and perhaps are in uh, school for another eight hours a day, oftentimes uh, because of um, multitasking and multimedia uh, consumption at the same time, the data goes over the 24 hours because children are very big on surfing the net and watching TV at the same time. But nonetheless, media consumption has been going through the roof. Uh, within that, if you will, television is still number one. Uh, no question about it. We're in that business. I assume most of you all are in the business. Television is still dominant. But if you were to look on the far right of the side of this chart, the, the fastest growth is really coming from internet, uh, computers, and mobile. Um, <clears throat> And with that in mind, there have been two major trends in the mobile industry, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about really quickly. And I really think all of this will inf influence all of our businesses. First trend is a proliferation of uh, the mobile web, if you will. Uh, children and adults around the world accessing the internet through their mobile devices. Uh, worldwide, over the past three years, you see a dramatic growth from just Two, three years ago, only 1% of the internet access around the world was accessed through mobile phones. Today is 10%. It's going to be at 25% before you know it. So mobile devices are, are 
becoming really important way of uh, accessing the internet across the world, ranging from, let's say, India, huge market where actually more people are accessing the internet through their mobile phones than computers anyway. Um, and that trend is going to apply to countries with higher GDP per capita as well. In the G20, for example, it's more people are accessing mobile, uh, the internet through mobile phones than in fixed landlines as is. That's going to triple, quadruple in two, three years. So by in 2015, in the 20 largest economies in, uh, in the world, uh, it'll be about 20, uh, approximately 2 billion uh, mobile broadband connections uh, and fixed internet connections are going to be, are going to grow, but they're still going to be dwarfed by mobile. It is a massive fundamental shift in how we're consuming media, uh, and that's going to impact all of our business, whether you're in the ch children's business or not. But being in the children's business, those, uh, that, a trend that I uh, just mentioned uh, has resulted in scenes that I think we're all very familiar with. Children love mobile phones, and uh, from higher income GDP per capita countries in, in Asia, Europe, the US to lower GDP capita countries in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, children are fascinated by, uh, by their mobile phones and uh, are using it for various reasons. So communication, obviously, learning, fun. It's a, it's a fascinating device. So that was one trend, mobile web proliferation. The second trend, uh, which has been quite massive and we're all very familiar with it, is that thanks to Mr. Steve Jobs and the Apple Corporation, uh, Cupertino, California, uh, who introduced the, originally the iPod uh, several years ago, and then obviously the iPhone and the iPad, uh, they've been responsible for starting a massive seismic shift in how children uh, and, and all of us are consuming media. Now, what I think is interesting to realize is, as you all probably remember, when the iPod first came out, it took after the first 10 quarters, let's say two and a half years, uh, when they first came out with the iPod, Apple had only sold about two million of them, believe it or not. That's two and a half, it took a while for the iPods, which seems like ages ago, to, to, to really kick in. Now with the iPhone, it was considerably different. Within, let's say two, two and a half years, they'd sold uh, 20 million, 20, 22 million units uh, over the course of two and a half years. Now, if you think that's fast, and as you can see from here, the iPod, iPad, excuse me, take up has dwarfed all of them. So Apple, within the first two and a half years, which is just around now since the first iPod, maybe a little bit longer, since the first iPad, excuse me, came out, they've sold, they're gonna hit 100 million uh, very soon, and, uh, and the whole industry has been created, and we're gonna dig into that industry in a bit. Um, as these, obviously, iPhones, iPads, uh, led to the creation of applications. And sorry, it's a little bit detailed, but I'll just touch on the, the, the top points. Um, and again, the app industry has been just growing incredibly rapidly. Uh, again, 2008, $700 million business as an industry, which isn't, uh, well, actually a little bit less, that includes mobile ads, but about three to 400 million. But that industry has been growing. The app business has been growing at 153 percent per year, and it's going to it's going to keep skyrocketing. Right now, app industry is around uh, app sales per annum are around uh, 13, 14 billion. Uh, I stop here at 2011, but by 2013, uh, 2014 is projected to hit 35 billion dollars. So, one doesn't need to be um, a, a scientist or a math genius to, to realize there's tremendous growth here, it's very real, it's how tr uh, people are consuming media, and these numbers are incredibly real. Uh, again, television is still massive, but as you saw, it, it's just quite flat. The growth is coming through mobile devices, and that's where children are, that's where consumers are, uh, and will be increasingly. Um, um, both of those trends, um, Obviously, mobile web and app proliferation has led to this scene, which we're seeing, again, all across the world. Children with their, uh, with their tablets, iPhones, iPad devices. Um, and in America, in, in the US, it's, the trend is, is really profound. Uh, seven out of 10 children are regularly using their, their iPads, and uh, uh, they're fascinated by it. 
Um, now, please recall, as I mentioned, when we first started, 1969, not that I was there then, but television was a primary technology of this platform. Our original thinking was, how can we use television to educate kids? Given the numbers, the trends, and everything that I've just presented, uh, we are now view digital technologies just as passionately, if not more so, uh, in many ways than, than, than television, because we view it as an opportunity to you know, help educate uh, and entertain children, help them reach their uh, truest potential. Uh, we launched our first app in uh, 2009, uh, two, three fairly simple ebook apps, and our business has skyrocketed since then. Uh, since then, we've produced well over 40 apps on five different platforms, not just uh, iOS as well, Android, and I'll get into that in a second. Well over 3 million downloads, and I must say, the business is just growing through the roof. Um, there's a phrase in the US, a hockey stick design, and that's uh, how sales have been. Uh, all right, um, just quickly on how we produce applications. Um, and I, I think even though we're a children's media company, some of these thoughts, uh, in, in my humble opinion, could be applicable to, uh, to, to all of you or whoever's interested in producing applications. Overall model isn't a whole, you know, isn't a million miles away from producing anything. And you guys know quite a bit about television. But I must say, it's absolutely our, our first step. And I'd recommend any of you who are seriously considering producing apps is to be incredibly targeted and con concrete and defined with the concept that you're trying to develop, uh, which is our, our first step. Uh, we personally view each app as a business, as a venture. Uh, we, we take a social entrepreneurial approach to it. Um, there's a financial cost associated with it, so we look at what kind of return that we get on that investment. Uh, we're a nonprofit, just in case I didn't mention or you didn't pick it up in the video. So. Um, it's very important for us to come up with projects that are sustainable, so we keep going. So, uh, but we have two bottom lines, if you will, financial and impact. So, in the very first stage, we've from a list of dozens and hundreds of ideas that we have. It's really important to define exactly what you want to do, set some goals, set some parameters, set some targets, uh, define the market, go out there and see what else is, uh, what, what else is out there that, that, that's similar to it. Uh, I think I'll touch on this a little later on, but producing a hit app is not easy. Angry Birds, our good friends who were here this morning who, who, who spoke, uh, one might think that's a very simple application, but it is not. Uh, it, a tremendous amount of work and effort has gone into producing that and distributing that. Uh, moreover, I think that app was their 50th app that that company produced. They had 49 other apps before Angry Birds, but those didn't do as well. And Angry Birds was the 50th that came and, and did amazingly well, and it's been a game-changing app. So really, really important in the digital world, and certainly in the app world, to be concise with the project that uh, you, you'd want to develop or else it's, gonna, it's not going to look good. Then we're going to jump into the production model a little bit and in distribution which, uh, and marketing, which is incredibly important. Uh, just one point on distribution. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's a really, really important one. For those of you who do work in, in digital technologies, it's, and I touched on this two seconds ago, it, if you are producing a digital product, your mindset should be one of gathering data, analytics, daily, weekly at most, learning from it and feeding that back into the product. A digital product is very different from, let's say, a feature film, which takes a tremendous amount of work and effort, and you produce it once, you launch it, and voila, that's it. You may have some options with regard to final edits here or there, packaging, this or that, but the product's done. It's out there. Television is somewhere in the middle because it, sometimes you produce series, you do have some you have opportunity to, to play around with the product. Digital products, be it an application, be it a website, are, they need love and attention and constant monitoring. And you've got to bring that mindset to the table. If you don't, if you're thinking of producing an application, just producing and getting it out there, and oh, that's going to be my Angry Birds, it's just not going to happen. So as you think through any digital project, in particular apps that you have, think through what's, really think through your distribution. And it's not a one-off, it's, on, it's in Google Marketplace, it's on iTunes, there it's done, it's gonna sell well. Far from it. 
Um, so you really need to bring the resources to, to monitor, to develop, to refine, to input. But I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more, distribution marketing. But that's a, just wanted to emphasize that just in case I forgot, because one doesn't have that mindset. Chances of success in the app world and the digital world is a lot less. Now, um, this was one of the questions I was asked to comment on, um, and it's an, I think it's a very important one. Um, do you make your apps yourself or do you outsource it? Producing it in-house, if you do have the resources, oftentimes give you more control and, uh, uh, and you, you can really keep up with how a project's coming along. But it does cost a lot more and you may have some issues because whoever is working on your team in-house may not be the very best at what they're supposed to do. Uh, just because they've only worked on your projects, they haven't had exposure to various other projects. Outsourcing, um, oftentimes actually allows you to go to find the best expert in, in the field uh, to do it. That said though, you lose control and um, there might be some issues. Well, how we do it, we outsource all of our development, but we do all of the content production in-house. Um, we don't have a large tech team, smaller team, but we have a lot of creative tech-oriented producers and, and who, who do the softer stuff, and then we work with developers, and we find that to work for us, but it's still different for everyone. Um, quickly, how do we go about, uh, uh, again, our, mark, uh, our app approach, and I, I, even though we focus on children, I think these steps, um, this, I, I think this, this mindset is applicable uh, to any business. First, again, identify the target audience, really important, define them, know as much about them as possible. Just producing an app and just getting out there is not good enough, or really have to be defined. Spend some time studying them, understanding them, what else are they buying, what else are they paying for. We focus on preschoolers, that's our thing, and we get to know very well. Uh, we spend a, quite a bit of time uh, evaluating educational benefits. Uh, that's really, really uh, uh, important for us. Um, we feel like educational topics and gameplays, uh, if they're created in a developmentally appropriate way, can be very impactful. So that's really big for us. And we're also an entertainment company, even though education is the heart of everything we do, so everything has to be fun and engaging. And we test, we monitor, and we adapt all the time. Uh, many people say Sesame Street has been a 43-year experiment. We're very big on experimentation. We're very big on taking calculated risks, learning from them, feeding that back into the model. And I would recommend whatever business you're in to, that's worked well for us. I would recommend following that. Uh, quickly, uh, more, more details of how it's made. First, whenever we've, as soon as we've come up with concept identification, run our numbers, looked at, done our analysis, and said, you know what, right, we're gonna go for this app. Seven steps, if you will. We like to create a prototype. Then um, this is applicable whether you're creating something for 24-year-olds or two to four-year-olds. Create a quick prototype um, uh, to share with your team or yourself, play around with it, which is step two. We send some notes back to our vendors. As mentioned, oftentimes the tech, word, uh, tech work is outsourced. Um, they play around with it. They send us what's called an alpha. You may have heard of alpha uh, products, beta products. The first one's an alpha. Um, and then it comes back to our production and educational teams. Uh, at Sesame Street, we have a whole floor of PhDs in child development and education who test everything we do and check everything we do. Um, so it goes through them, and we send it back. It comes back for additional testing. This is a very iterative process. It must happen for a successful app or a digital product. Uh, and things to look for. I'll quickly touch on. I mentioned we've produced 40 applications. We've been fortunate enough to have learned quite a bit and worked with some great partners who've really helped us along the way. But um, interactive design uh, is really, really key and important. Um, uh, I'll just touch on a few notes I've written down here so I don't forget anything, but certainly not all of them. All of our apps start with a simple greeting. It's really important to have that for children to feel like welcome when they, come, uh, when they uh, uh, open an app. Um, if to state the instructions very clearly and what children are trying to accomplish, if they get the wrong answer to a question, we view that as the opportunity to teach them a new answer. If they get an answer correctly, there's a little payoff to make them feel good and, and proud of themselves is really important. Uh, text instructions don't necessarily work with children. They can't read. 
Uh, then again, audio can be a little bit too much as well, so it's important to use video. So it's really important to, to think through the interactive design. Uh, gestures, massive. Uh, as adults, as grown-ups, uh, oftentimes we take gestures for granted, but um, there's some gestures that are intuitive for children, some are not. Uh, tapping, drawing, swiping, and dragging and sliding, these are all very intuitive for kids, some of the young kids. But you know, pinching is not. Tilting is not. They're two-year-olds. They can't tilt an iPad, you know. So if they're shaking, forget about it. It's a five, seven hundred dollar device there, and it's, it's difficult to do. Multi-touch is very difficult. Uh, last thing you want to do, flicking. They can't. So it's kind of cute, but uh, you know, we do a lot of testing, but we've learned a lot. And and again, this is for kids. You should go through that if you're seriously considering an app, whether it's for however old uh, people are. Screen design, again, uh, for any platform if possible, uh, Orm said. Um, it's really important to um, be clear as to what the necessary steps are. Next stage you go, scrolling below, scrolling on applications is very tough for kids. We don't do it. Uh, hot spots, areas they touch have to be clearly marked. Um, be clear whenever there's more content. All of this stuff has to be thought through. Um, and it might seem a little bit overwhelming. I've got a few more of these. But the point here is that it's not a trivial process to create an app, to create a uh, hit app. There are well over seven, 800,000 apps in the, app, in the, iPhone st in the iTunes store alone, about the same, and Android, touch on it. But just producing an app and getting it out there isn't going to cut it. The, the hit apps, uh, they go through a lot of this thinking, a lot of this process. Visual layout is important. Uh, just a little FYI, preschoolers like to hold uh, iPads in, uh, in landscape format, not uh, portrait. That makes all the difference in the world. Um, due to weight constraints, this is heavy for, uh, for a, a small child. They oftentimes put it on their lap and their hands go on it on the sides. So don't put any hot buttons on the corner, if you will, uh, because it'll activate itself. And I'll show you. Uh, uh, an image here in a second. Audio design is really, really important. Intentionality is, is uh, it's an interesting word that probably don't come across when it comes to apps, but um, children, whenever they, they pick up a digital device, they want to click, 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 click. There's no tomorrow. Um, it's important to be very clear with how you design, design an app. And, and it might be a little too techy, but we design ours so whenever, as soon as they touch something, when they release it, something is activated. Different apps, different developers produce differently, but that's a really important one. Um, other load time is really important. Uh, if you are cross-selling anything, for us, keep it in the parent section. Um, sound effects, really important. Children want to feel like they've accomplished, accomplished something, uh, if it's working, uh, uh, whenever they touch something. So we put a lot of thought into to all of these. Um, 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 and I would recommend you're doing that as well. Um, so as a result, uh, just quickly, consider the unique aspects of the technology of the platform. Make it fast, make it explicit, visual, less is more. Oftentimes, as, as grown-ups, I like to put absolutely everything on there, but there's an art to be said to leaving things out. Uh, uh, make it parent-friendly. Uh, children's applications are used with uh, parents oftentimes, so make sure they understand. And consistency is really important, so same colors, same everything um, uh, can indicate what, uh, how they should proceed. Um, just a quick illustration. I won't get into this in detail, but uh, the application on the right is called Elmo Loves ABCs. At one of our top apps, we're very fortunate, it's been done really well on iTunes Store. When we first, when we were about to release it, the initial design looked like what you see on the left. Uh, and children were having a really tough time with this one. Uh, as I may have touched on, the bottom left and bottom right, kids put their hands there. So they were starting the music without even in intending. They were clicking on cue like there's no tomorrow. Like, what is it? What's the fascination with cue there? And then we did some research, uh, focus groups, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> I said, oh my god, this is what it's all about. So we changed the design. The ABCs go up and left. This, whenever you hit one of those, by the way, one of the letters, it's an opportunity to draw it with your hands. It's a great application. Um, and you can watch videos with it. But So we changed the design, uh, uh, reduced the, you know, moved the letters up, and, and we feel like 
our research has helped us create one of the top selling apps uh, on the iTunes store, certainly for the preschool market. Um, <clears throat> now, some quick thoughts about, just, just high level thoughts about uh, mobile market as a whole. This is more, again, grown up stuff, uh, worth knowing because as I showed earlier, that that's where the market's going, this is where the industry is going. Uh, right now, we're living, in a, it's a two horse race, if you will, between, uh, between the mobile platforms. Uh, iOS, which is Apple's platform, and Android. Collectively, uh, they have about 70, 80% of the smartphone market. Microsoft is making a big push. They're coming in, uh, partnered with Nokia, early days, but right now, it's Android and Apple. And Android is the biggest of, of them. Main reason is, they're very big in China. Android controls 80% of the Chinese uh, smartphone market, and as a result of that, it's helped them even a massive lead uh, in the market overall. That said, though, as big as Android is, the revenues are, for the most part, uh, in the iTunes store. Apple buyers are, I'm sorry, Apple iOS owners are much more likely to purchase applications. And um, actually, I was reading the other day, Apple has given out to the developer partners $2.5 billion over the past two, three years. That's the amount of revenues that have been generated by developers who are selling products on, on, on Apple. Uh, games are huge. They're the number one uh, platform. Uh, I'm sorry, number one product, uh, app product. Uh, as you can imagine, 67% of the people purchase games. That said, a little closer to what uh, we do at our company is, is the education market. Education applications are really growing fast. Uh, parents aren't necessarily waking up every morning thinking, I want more entertainment for my child. They are, in our opinion, waking up thinking, how can I educate my child and keep him or her entertained as well. As a result, education sector is growing fast. By the way, these are a little bit difficult to read. I'm going through fast. Uh, I'll follow up with you guys later. If I can share any of this with you, happy to send it later, so no need to take notes. Um, another reason education is more growing, just an uh, industry to keep an eye on, is mobile education. Grow growing incredibly rapidly. Uh, perhaps not a, like a core competency of, of something that wasn't a mine or a topic as to what we're talking about here, but mobile education market is growing rapidly, projected to be 38 billion by 2020. Already is huge. Asia in particular is really big. Um, and yeah, that's, that's one to keep an eye on. And again, from an educational point of view, children who download apps, the number one reason they do it is to play games, but right behind that, uh, it's for educational purposes. 57% uh, purchase applications for educational reasons. So that's the market we're playing in personally, and it's a very exciting one. Uh, pricing, uh, educational applications uh, command a premium, uh, a little bit uh, higher than the normal applications, so that's good for us. Um, if you do produce applications, uh, pricing is really, really important. Currently, the average app price rate uh, at iTunes stores is $1.76. It can go up much higher to full-on maps, eight, nine bucks, it's $1.76. Uh, but a trend to be aware of are called in-app purchases. Uh, currently, 60-something, 60 64% of the revenues Apple receives aren't necessarily from purchasing an app. You download an app for free. Within, it, within that app, the opportunities you get to purchase more. That's huge. It's growing really rapidly. 64% already. Really quickly, in just five, six months, last in, in 2010, when it started taking off, uh, <laughs> The number of applications within app purchases tripled. Uh, that's how a lot of people, most people, are making, uh, generating revenues in the iTunes store through in-app purchases. More difficult for children's apps, but something to keep in mind. Um, app marketing, really important to realize that even though it's a digital product, even though you have Apple, we like to think of the four Ps of marketing, any business students in the house, still apply. Product, price, placement, promotion, those really apply. It's, it's a digital product, but nonetheless, it's a product. One needs to think through uh, how you're pricing it, how you're promoting it, really, really important. Branding, massively important. Uh, 
um, using social media to connect to bloggers, to, to, to writers, to your fans, really, really important. Um, uh, merchandising is very important. Whenever you have an application, on, 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 whether it's um, on Google Play or, or, or Amazon uh, or iTunes, um, how you describe it makes a tremendous amount of uh, difference as to how it's sold, the images that you choose, the titles, all of that, really, really important. A lot of thought needs to go through in it. A lot of experimentation needs to go through in it. Um, um, making it viral, giving people an opportunity to tell others about it, really important. Um, now, challenge that if you are for those who are uh, making application, applications, a couple of challenges. One is, if you are trying to charge for it, uh, it's pretty tr tricky. Your application has to, to be unique and deliver, I would say, outstanding, overwhelming value or reason to purchase it, because most apps are free. Um, and there are a lot of really good free apps out there. So if you, are, if you do want to create something, you want to charge for it, Really, it goes back to concept ident identification as well. Really think through, is this what people want? Will someone pay for this? Because most apps, over, you know, almost 90% of all apps are free. And there's some really good ones within the free apps that get the job done. So that's one uh, issue to be aware of. Uh, piracy uh, becoming uh, uh, fairly important, uh, I would say. I, I, well. For many people, very important. I'd say 30, difficult to track, but approximately 30% of all app sales are, are, are pirated. Um, Android in particular, uh, a little bit more so, well, a lot, so, uh, considerably more than, 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 than uh, Apple because um, there are not that many checks whenever you produce an Android app and submit it to, to, to Google or various Android stores, and there are hundreds of them. With Apple, it's a very rigorous process, so it's more difficult to pirate Apple apps. So it does happen. Android, it's big, and, and people, I'd say around 30% is the latest in terms of what people are losing. Finally, just really quickly, US and uh, Europe are about 70% of the app market today. It's changing. Asia's big, as you can imagine. Uh, the big growth opportunities are, surprise, surprise, China and India. In many ways, US and UK are mature already, and in Western European countries. A lot of mobile handsets there already, a lot of downloads. This is a tough one to read from there, I'm sure. But uh, the two circles on the bottom left are uh, China and India, where smartphone penetration is still low, and number of user app engagement is still low. So there's, they're going to grow, and it's just tremendous opportunities. An interesting statistic, currently about 85% of all applications uh, that uh, are produced are in English language, but only 8% of the world's population speaks English. Uh, Chinese in particular, Mandarin for the most part, there are, um, it's 22% of the world's uh, language, but only 16% of the apps. So that's going to change, opportunities there. Um, and one final thought, as much as we've talked about the industry, the size of industry today, and the growth potential, and how buzzy this, 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 this sector is, um, we're still in the early stages. There's still just under a billion smartphones around the world. There's six billion feature phones, those older phones. And they're, they're migrating over to smartphones. And, um, and that represents tremendous opportunities for us to educate and entertain children and, and for all of you to produce uh, digital mobile applications that complement and supplement your, your other products or uh, act as standalone uh, business ventures. And, and I really appreciate your taking the time and listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's one question. How do you customize TV content to make it suitable for online mobile consumption? That is an excellent question, which I believe applies to not just television content, but to book content, any other content. And the short answer is distill the TV content to the brand essence, of the, to, to the essence of what's really important about that content. Is it, the, is, it the, is it the characters, is it the show, is it the branding, whatever it is. Transport, if you try to transport a product, a, 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 uh, an entertainment product, wholesale from what it is to the app world, it's just not going to work. There are different media, and each medium has its own specific nuances. So really think through, let's say in, this, in the case of the first one, the TV product, what is it that makes it special? What's unique? What do people like? 
and focus on transporting those and creating a mobile application that enhances those. If you try to do the whole thing, if you try to have your cake and eat it too, as the saying goes, it's just, totally from experience, it's just not gonna work. Uh, less is more. Bear in mind with digital product, you can introduce more content later on. So let's say you, you have this TV product um, application and you do a sort of mini application version of it. If it goes well, you know, you can add more to it. Later, come back and, 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 and issue upgrades and, and releases and add more to it. But right off the bat, if you try to do everything, it's just going to be a little too confusing. It's not going to work. Focus on what I think basics are. Uh, second question, what are your thoughts and consideration for audio design for an app? You guys must be in the app business because these are excellent questions. Uh, audio is, um, is tremendously important and oftentimes, audio design in particular, is, is oftentimes an afterthought. And that is so wrong. Uh, we are far more um, uh, in tune and sensitive to what we hear, uh, both in terms of instructions and, and getting confirmation when something works, not, just, uh, not, not to mention the entertainment aspect that comes with audio. Uh, we think this through very carefully. In fact, my office is right next to our audio designer and engineer. Right off the bat, I, I watch him work every single day. It's really important to be close to it because you can have a visually, uh, uh, visually fascinating uh, and stunning product with great instructions. If the audio is missing, it's just, I don't know, it'd be like a meal without salt. It's just, it can look great, fantastic, but it's just not gonna work. Not a good area to, to short change, by the way. Oftentimes, audio is added, is budgeted late. Uh, people cut that a lot, music, what have you. Uh, not, I wouldn't recommend that, having made that mistake many times myself in the past. Uh, and I believe that's it. So thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Pleasure to be here.